The scary stories will start in 30 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. As always, there are minimal ads in this video. Only two mid-roll ads. And I took extra time to ensure that the rain sounds were perfectly balanced with my voice and that there are zero mistakes in my narrations. So again, if you enjoy this video and you want to show your support, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me more than you know. Now, let's begin. I recently started school again, and as a part of my daily routine, I am required to travel to Toronto Monday through Friday via the train and subway lines. It's a good two hours one way, so I usually pull out a good book, pop in my headphones, and relax to some music. I, of course, being from out of town, have heard a lot of horror stories that many people have endured on the subway. Naturally, I thought most of it was just exaggerations and tall tales. Well, I was very quickly proven dead wrong. About a week ago, I had just finished a very long and grueling day of school, and I wanted nothing more than to just get home and relax as soon as possible. I took my usual bus route to the subway station and sat down on one of the seats directly beside one of the exit doors. Now, a little context. I am facing forward, looking at one seat ahead of me, across the aisle of the subway car. This seat was occupied by a woman that looked to be in her twenties. She was what looked like playing a game on her phone and was paying absolutely no attention to anything going on around her. Next to this seat opposite me is another seat that faces this lady on her phone, and it is this person in this seat that made my 40-minute subway ride very disturbing. Occupying this seat was another lady that looked to be about 40 years old and possessed a very creepy smile. I say this because she never stopped smiling, and I mean she was smiling the entire subway ride. For the first half of the ride, she was staring at the younger lady on her phone, laughing and muttering to herself. She also would occasionally take her phone out of her purse and take pictures of the girl on her phone. About halfway to my destination, the younger girl that was on her phone left the subway car, and the smiling lady's attention was then directed at me. She turned to face me, and gave me a huge, disturbing, toothy grin. I just stared at a poster on the roof of the train for what felt like hours. Eventually she got the hint that I was avoiding her gaze like the plague and went to plan B. She opened up her purse and removed a tube of toothpaste. She then proceeded to ingest at least half the tube. I damn near threw up, but somehow held it together, even though while she did this, she was still smiling at me, while laughing, now her face covered in toothpaste. My stop finally came, and I bolted from that subway car as fast as I could. I got to the escalator and glanced back to the car, and guess who I see walking fast towards me? arms held still at her side, still smiling. I was understandably completely terrified at this point. I ran out of the station into the bus. I made it onto the bus just as it pulled away from the station. I took one final look back, and there she was, standing on the platform, head cocked to the side, laughing and waving goodbye to me. Around two years ago, I finally moved into a brand new house in a brand new building estate in Australia. I was one of the first to have finished a build in the area and was elated to finally gain independence. The first few weeks went by as normal, and during that time, I would often take walks alone with my dog in the afternoons and roam the surrounding estate area. 
All the roads around us had been partially completed, and all the other properties were marked out, but no other houses were built, excluding the one that was directly opposite mine. The house looked finished, but there was no driveway laid yet, and from what I could gather, no one lived there. To the left of my house, roughly a few hundred meters away, was a field with a huge hill in it. I later found out that the whole area was council property. Not only was no one allowed to build up there, but the whole hill was basically a no-go zone. For whatever reason, the council just didn't want people on it, so the whole area was surrounded by a huge chain-link fence. The only other noticeable feature in the area was a small abandoned farmhouse with a shed a few kilometers down the road. I knew nothing about it and often went walking there with the dog as it gave me something mild to explore amongst the vast nothingness I was living around. The entire place was dilapidated and completely inhabitable, but it was still interesting nonetheless. About a month or two after moving in, I awoke one morning to the sound of a violin. It sounded extremely distant and quite haunting. I actually enjoyed it and assumed that the neighbors opposite me had finally moved in. Excited that I finally had some people to talk to, I peeked out the curtain and saw the house opposite mine was still as vacant as it ever was. I got dressed, but by the time I managed to look outside, the violin had stopped. This happened roughly every second day of the next week. The violin would wake me up and then just disappear after about 45 seconds. I would ignore it to the point where my curiosity simply got the better of me, and the next morning when I heard the violin playing again, I immediately jumped out of bed and shot out the front door. I scoured the early morning surrounding, and there, up on the hill, was a figure playing a violin. It was barely light, but the person looked very tall from the distance I was at, and as they were playing, they were doing what could only be described as a waltz-type walk, spinning slowly around in a circle as they played. I took my eyes off the person and walked over to pick up the morning paper, and in the ten seconds that took me, I heard the violin stop. When I looked up, I noticed the figure was no longer playing or dancing, but was now standing still and most likely looking in my direction. It was so dark, I couldn't see them clearly, and we both just stood there for half a minute, not moving, before the creeps got the better of me, and I went back inside. After that morning, things started happening. On my walks, I began to notice footprints on the surrounding properties that weren't made by me, and that I had never seen before which I just assumed were from people walking up from the other housing areas down the road. I never awoke to the violin, but I swore I could hear someone walking on the street next to my bedroom window in the early mornings. However, I never saw anything. Other really general things as well, like random tools such as spades and rakes laying around the area, which I guessed were left there by construction crews none of which I ever saw. I would start getting calls at work that would immediately hang up on me, and I also stopped walking up to the abandoned farmhouse, as the experience with the violin player had me a little shaken. One night, as I was heading to bed, I turned off the television in the living room, and again, could hear the faint sound of a violin playing. However, it sounded more muffled and rehearsed, I froze, and a cold chill flowed through me instantaneously, considering that it was about midnight and not the usual time I would hear it playing. I went to the front window and peeked out to see that there was a light in the house opposite mine. It was clearly a candle, as I could see the dim light flicker in the empty window, and the music sounded like it was coming from an old record player. But in the ten minutes I watched, I never saw any movement inside the house. I moved away from the window sufficiently freaked out, 
and after another five minutes, I heard the music abruptly stop. I peeked out again to notice the light was now out. I never saw anyone. I began to become unsettled in the house, and would often invite friends over to hang out, until late. But of course, nothing would ever happen when someone else was with me. I never bothered to tell any of my friends, as without evidence, I figured they would just not believe me and I would just become more agitated. But nothing compared to what happened next. In my living area, the desk sits right next to a small window, which looks out to the fence surrounding my property. The steel fence is literally an arm's length from my house, and about six feet tall, so I always figured that unlike most of the other windows, I would never need to cover this one with a sheet or blanket because no one could ever see in. I usually had headphones on when I played, and I always had the lights off, for no other reason than I preferred to play games in the dark. One night when I was gaming, I got up and walked into the dark kitchen to get a beer out of the fridge. It was dead silent, excluding the faint sound coming out of my headphones. As I closed the fridge and turned around to face the desk, I saw directly out the window two very, very faint lights. I didn't even catch on and immediately started walking back to the desk, fixated on the small glowing balls and it wasn't until I had my nose almost pressed against the glass that I realized the two lights weren't lights at all. They were eyes. A set of eyes, sitting above the fence line, staring wide open at me. They didn't blink. They didn't move. My entire body locked up. All I could do was simply stare back, as my brain was still comprehending that there was an actual person looking at me in the scariest way I could possibly ever imagine. I don't know what happened. Either my head kicked into gear, or my muscles loosened, but my body automatically collapsed, and I fell to the floor, scurrying to hide against the wall, away from the window. I could hear my heart beating through the carpet like a drum as I tried to lay as flat as possible, and as my mind was still processing the sheer severity of the situation, a violin started playing. That violin, and the haunting tune it always emitted, started up. Except this time, it was directly outside my window, and much louder than I had ever heard it before. The lights were still off, and I wanted to get up to turn off the PC screen so I couldn't be seen but my whole body just wasn't ready to cooperate. Not only was the sound of the instrument extraordinarily loud, but it sounded like it was being played with frustration, notes being missed frequently, and the strings screeching. The pace of it was getting faster and faster, and by this time, my dog Jeb, out in the backyard, had picked up on the situation, and registering an unfamiliar sound, gave one solitary deep bark. The violin instantly stopped, and the house was finally dead silent, excluding my headphones, which I could hear quietly working away. I was still frozen to the carpet, and it wasn't until Jeb gave a second menacing bark that I heard the figure outside the window start to walk away, in the direction of my yard. Once that first footstep hit the ground, I instantly thought of the welfare of my best friend, and finally, my head connected with my extremities, and my entire body kicked into overdrive. I left from the ground and slid across the laminated floor to the back door, where Jeb was standing, staring into the backyard. I ducked to keep low, and quietly unlocked and slid open the door. Usually, doing so would notify Jeb that he was allowed inside, but when the door opened up, he didn't move an inch, and was completely fixated on the pitch-black backyard. Everything told me not to go outside, but there was no chance I was letting anything happen to my dog, and I moved out onto the alfresco, moved behind Jeb, put my hand under his collar, and attempted to back him toward the house. Jeb is a pure Labrador, 
and weighs like a sack of sand, so when he doesn't want to move, it takes a sheer force to pull him in the direction you want him to go. And right now, Jeb wasn't going anywhere. I yanked at his scruff, and as I did, he emitted a bark like I had never heard before. A deep, bellowing sound that elevated my nerves to an all-time high. We both just stood there, waiting for some form of reply, and I couldn't remember how long we both just froze there. But eventually, I heard footsteps from around the side of the house begin to walk away. But not a simple walk. Almost like whoever was doing it was slowly dancing in a circle, the footsteps keeping to a beat as they drifted away from the house into the distance. Once I couldn't hear anything, Jeb licked his lips, gave me a look, and wandered back inside. I followed, locked the door behind me, and spent the night reverting to my childlike self, hiding under my bed covers with my dog. I didn't sleep a wink. That was the last time I ever saw or heard the violin player. The following morning when the sun finally came up, I called into work sick and then called the police. They scoured the lot next to mine and found footprints in the dirt. However, there were so many there that it was impossible to tell whose were whose. The only description I could give to the officer was his height. He would have had to be over six feet to stare over that fence at me, but they explained that he could have been standing on something, or on his toes. They also told me that they've never received a report of anyone playing a violin in the area, or of anyone being in the fenced off hill either. I essentially looked like an insane person, but the officers were very nice about the whole thing, and offered to patrol the area for the next few nights which helped put my mind at ease. Nothing else has happened since then. Over the next year or two, people finally started moving in, and I tell them all the story about the figure I saw, some of which still used to keep their children in line, which I found funny. One guy nicknamed the council lot, Violin Hill, and the name has stuck around our street since then. I'm still in this house. I still tell people the story, and I haven't changed my routine one bit, which has really helped me to block out the fear of the experience. Although one thing has changed. I game with the blinds closed now. This happened when I was about 13 or 14. When I was a young teenager, back in the fall of 2006, me, my family, and my neighbors started having bizarre encounters with an old man in a dark red minivan. Back then, I used to live on a hill above an old non-operational fishing village. It was about a 40 minute drive outside of the city, along a highway. The highway to the village was a dead end. There was nothing down that way, except housing. There wasn't even motels or any stores. Most of the houses were homes to elderly people, while the others were abandoned fishing stages that overlooked the water. It was very strange to see anyone that we didn't recognize down in that area, especially from September until May. We would get the odd tourist during the summer months, but never from fall to spring. When I was in middle school, Every day after I got home off the bus, I would walk up to the mailbox. It was about a good 15 minute walk along the highway. The mailbox was up the road towards the city. Past my house, there was only about eight other houses, all on the same side of the road as mine. After those houses, it was just thick trees and marshes. I used to like to call the area Silentville instead of Silent Hill. We were right on the very edge of the east coast, right by the ocean. It was a fog bank all year round. It was rare that we would get sunny days. Even when it was sunny in the city, it was still foggy down there. Sometimes the fog was so thick, you could barely see a few feet ahead of you. 
One afternoon after school, while I was on my usual trek back to home after checking the mailbox, I heard the rattling of a vehicle in the distance. I always walked facing traffic, since my mother would have a fit if I didn't. It was crawling towards me, its headlights clearing the fog. It was probably going about five miles per hour, which was odd, considering the speed limit was about 70. The minivan came to a halt, about 10 feet ahead of me. It just stopped, right in the middle of the highway. I continued towards it. I figured it was someone looking for directions. As I neared the window of the car, I could see an old man sitting in the driver's seat. He was of a fairly small build, with light gray patches of hair on his head. His eyes were very watery and of dark blue color. Hello, young lady, he said in a very soft voice. Hi, I responded. He started making small talk with me. I really can't remember what, but it was just sort of casual talking. Something I found odd was that he kept one of his hands wedged between the two seats. I could sort of make out what seemed to be something of a metallic material under his hand. After chatting with me a bit, he slowly turned his head away and then continued up the road towards the city. I shrugged it off, just figuring that he was a relative of someone down in the village, and continued home. About a week went by without seeing him, and by then, he was just a memory. I was on my way up to the mailbox when I heard the familiar sound of rattling coming down the roads toward me. Him again? I thought. I was a little weirded out by him, so I jumped down into the ditch and hid in the brush. I watched as he sluggishly drove by. The entire time, he was looking around, observing. Sort of like a hunter looking for prey. After he was long out of sight, and I couldn't hear his vehicle anymore, I jumped up from the ditch and hurried my way up to the mailbox. The last six-minute stretch of road had no housing, so it was pretty isolated. After snatching up the mail, I started hurrying back, and that's when I ran into him again, in the worst place possible. The long stretch with no houses. This time, he was coming up the road quite fast. I didn't have time to hide. He pulled up next to me and said, Hello, dearie. Why were you down in the ditch earlier? Oh, crap, I thought. He had seen me. Oh, I thought I had seen a cat down there, I said. You like cute animals, dearie? You can get in the back seat and play with my puppy. She loves kids, he said, smiling. Uh, no thanks, I said, as I started to walk away. He reached out of his window and grabbed my arm. Please, dearie, I insist. I can drive you home. You live there, right? and then pointed at my house. I stood there dumbfounded. How did he know which house I lived in? I shook him off and started to run. He started backing his car up after me, and I bolted to my house and didn't look back. At the time, my aunt lived a few houses up the road from my house, so I decided to run to her driveway and started frantically banging on her door. She came to the door to let me in. I used her phone and called my mother to come pick me up. After we got home, I told her everything. She was very upset and called the police. They basically told us that they couldn't do anything, especially since we didn't have a license plate number. After that, I wasn't allowed to go on walks. He continued to show up, usually twice a week, right after my school bus dropped me off, and he would come driving slowly down the road. One day my neighbor asked him what he was doing, and he responded, Oh, I'm just a lonely gentleman. I saw a woman one day down the road, working on her garden, and she just captured my heart. My neighbor told him that she was married. He just laughed and said something along the lines of, If you want love to work, you have to work for it, and then drove off. My neighbor got the license plate and called the police. About 40 minutes later the police came down, 
but he was long gone by then. Our neighbor waved the police over and talked to them. They told him the car had been reported stolen a few months back. Sometime during November, my parents were out in the evening doing yard work. He stopped in front of our yard and was asking my parents where I was. He said that he missed our time together and that he felt neglected. My parents got very upset and chased him away. A few days later, I was up late playing Final Fantasy in the den. The den was on the bottom floor. I used to keep all the blinds open with the lights off in the room. I liked looking at the night sky. People could probably see me through the window, since it was facing the street. So there I was, illuminated by the TV, all cuddled up in my big armchair, having a late night gaming session, probably about 2 o'clock in the morning and I see the familiar red minivan slowly coming down the road. I froze. It parked a few feet up the road from my property, in between our house and the house next door. There was a small driveway that led to nowhere, going in between our land. He stopped his car, turned it off, and then came out. I watched in horror as he walked closer to our house. I was terrified. I pushed myself as far back into the chair as I could, hoping he wouldn't see me. I felt like screaming, but my parents were upstairs, and both were sound sleepers. He paced back and forth in front of our house, sort of staring. He was looking into the den. Now, this is the extremely strange part. He just stopped in place and then laid down on the side of the road in front of our house. He just lay there for a good hour. I was frozen with fear the entire time. After about an hour he got up and then strolled back to his car and left. I ran upstairs crying and told my parents. They called the police again, but he was gone by the time they got to us. We were all frustrated. The police, despite having his license plate, couldn't do anything, and this guy was coming around, harassing and terrifying us and our neighbors. This went on until about March. About a month passed without seeing him, and that is when we got the news. Our neighbor, who was good friends with someone that lived down a dead-end road, up a bit further, had been on a walk to his friend's house. He spotted the red minivan off in a driveway of a house that had just been put up for sale. The people were moved out. He got filled with anger when seeing it and ran over. When he got closer, he noticed blood on the passenger side window. He then went to the closest house and used their phone to call 911. He went back over to the car to check it out. He was pretty ballsy. He was sort of the neighborhood protector. The car doors were unlocked. He looked in the window to see a wallet, which had an ID in it, and a bloody wrench that was wedged between the two seats. He left and waited for the police to arrive. Our neighbor stayed in contact with the police. Apparently the guy had left in a hurry, leaving his ID behind. Turns out, he had just been released from prison not too long ago, for offenses towards minors. We didn't get any details though, and we never found out whose blood was smeared all over the interior of the van. For context, I am a 14 year old, and two days ago, something very creepy and unnerving happened to me. I am on the cross-country team at my school, and our coach wants us to stay in shape during quarantine, so I was going on a run. I tend to run early in the morning, around 5.30 or 6, because the weather is cooler and less people are out and about. It's also nice to get your run over with so that the rest of the day is free. For you to understand exactly what happened, I need to explain the route that I run, so bear with me. I live in a nicer neighborhood in the US. My neighborhood is also near a major road. 
When I go on my run, I leave my neighborhood, travel down the main road, and enter a different neighborhood that is close to my own. This neighborhood has a low crime rate, is on the richer side, and goes along a big reservoir. It has lots of hills, and some of the bigger houses near the entrance of the neighborhood are backed up against some woods. I run through it because I like to look at the big houses, and sometimes some of the wildlife, such as deer, which sometimes makes its way out of the woods. When I run through it early in the morning, I get to enjoy the lack of people and the bird song. You need to understand that I run this route every morning, and no strange occurrences have happened with me being there. Now that you understand this setup, I'll tell you what happened. Like I said, this was two days ago. I left my house and neighborhood per usual and ran along the major road to the entrance of the neighborhood that I usually run in. Almost as soon as I come across the first house on the street, one of the ones that is backed up against some woods, I hear a rustling in the bushes. I think, Oh, cool, it's probably one of the deer, and slow down to try to spot it. But it never came out of the bushes. So I pick up my pace and continue along. Not long after that, maybe two minutes later, I hear someone on a bike behind me. This isn't unusual, so I don't think much about it. Until the guy on the bike says, Beep, beep. So I'm thinking, Okay, maybe he doesn't have a bell or something, so I move over to the right to let the guy pass me on my left. But he doesn't. He stays right behind me. I'm not a slow runner, but someone on a bike would definitely be faster than me. If you have ever tried to go really slow on a bike, you will understand how hard it is to keep your balance. So I'm thinking, okay, this is really weird. I have a feeling that this guy is bad news, and I need to shake him. So I slow to a stop and get over to the side of the road to tie my shoe, which doesn't really need to be tied, and to see if he'll pass me. He doesn't. He just stopped. When it becomes clear that he isn't going anywhere, I get back on the sidewalk and keep running. Bad choice, I know, but I was panicking. Of course, the man on the bike follows, but even though my attempt to shake him didn't work, I did get a good look at him. He was tall and thin, with glasses, and he wore a Nirvana t-shirt. He definitely looked like a serial killer. As an avid reader of horror novels and an obsessive listener of scary podcasts, I was already thinking of the absolute worst possible outcome. I was going to be murdered when I had been out of my house for less than 10 minutes. Worse, I was over two miles from my house, so I was going to have to continue running. Now, I know that what I should have done was go to the closest house and let the family that lived in it know what was going on, but I wasn't thinking clearly. So I kept running, and the man on the bike kept following me at a meticulously slow pace. I was tired, sweaty, and near tears. I wanted to go home. Home was the only thing on my mind. I started looking around for ways to lose him or hide. Just up ahead of me was a sharp turn. My hope was that I could get around the turn faster than him and then hide. Not a very well-developed plan, but better than being killed by a random person I sprinted around the corner as fast as I could, right into a young woman who was out walking her two dogs. Big dogs. German shepherds, actually. I started to apologize profusely, trying to look calm. Apparently, I did not look calm at all, because she asked me what was wrong. The man was still behind me, practically breathing down my neck. I stared at the woman pleading with my eyes, and said, H How is your walk going, Mom? I prayed that she would understand, that she would play along. And fortunately for me, she did. She smiled at me and said, Where were you? Me and your father were looking all over for you. We both then turned to look at the man on the bike, who looked extremely shocked. 
He turned around and quickly pedaled away, almost running into an oncoming car. As soon as he was gone, I broke down crying, telling the woman everything. She was very sympathetic and kind, and she ended up calling my parents to come pick me up. I was still sobbing when they arrived, and I had to catch my breath before telling them what happened. Looking back, I am almost positive that if I hadn't run into that woman, that something awful would have happened. I'm not sure if the rustling in the bushes at the entrance of the neighborhood was that man, or not, but I am completely content with never knowing. I have not been back to that neighborhood since, and I'm not sure if I ever will. Hey, this is Being Scared. I really hope you're enjoying the video, and if you are, please consider subscribing if you aren't already. I promise I will never stop making these videos for you, and there will always be minimal ads. Alright, back to the stories. This happened back in the summer of ninth grade, so I was invited to sleep over at this kid named Jacob's house. Jacob had this reputation for having a bad family and just being weird and awkward himself. He was in my math class, and I was partnered up with him for a project where I helped boost his mark, so I guess he sort of warmed up to me. For his birthday, he held a sleepover and invited three other kids and myself to come. I didn't really want to go, but I told my friends about the invitation, and they convinced me to just go, saying that it would be fun, and that I would figure out what kind of guy Jacob really was. I was hyped up by my friends, and decided to go after all. I was dropped off by my mom, and when I stepped onto the porch, I realized that the doorbell looked broken, like the rectangular case that covered the wiring and stuff was shattered. I had a sudden fear of being electrocuted, so I went to knock instead. Just as I raised my fist, I noticed some muffled shouting from within the house, loud enough to be heard over the hum of my mom's car's engine. The shouting kind of alarmed me, and I turned to look at the car, which was waiting for me to enter the house. I started having second thoughts of staying, but the idea of looking like a coward in front of my friends motivated me to knock loudly. The shouting cut abruptly, so abruptly that I thought that they were just watching TV or something, and then muted it when I knocked. The door suddenly swung open, and I was expecting a huge, looming figure to tower over me, but all I saw was skinny, pale Jacob. His face brightened when he saw me, and he ushered me inside. I waved to my mom and watched her back out of the driveway and drive down the road. I peered into the house, but from the entrance, I could only see the living room, a staircase, and a hallway. All three areas were empty, but I saw the flickering light of a TV from the turn of the hall. Jacob took me upstairs into the very last room. It was an extraordinarily clean room, with a dresser and a bed pushed together into the corner, and an analog clock hanging from the wall, leaving a lot of the room completely empty. To my dismay, I was the first one there. I thought of how awkward it would be if no one else showed up, and that thought made me panic a bit. I sat down on the carpet and pulled my iPod Touch out of my backpack, asking Jacob to put in his Wi-Fi's password. He took my iPod and fiddled around with it for at least five minutes. Each minute grew longer and more awkward, until I asked, Did you forget the password? Jacob bit his lip, and then the doorbell rang. I jumped to my feet and told him, I'll get it, you just try and remember the password. I hurried down the stairs and opened the front door, where I saw a kid that I didn't know very well. I only knew he was in our grade, I brought him upstairs, telling him, Oh, I'm glad you came. I thought I would be the only one. To which he said, I wouldn't have come if my mother didn't make me. We walked into the room, and I noticed Jacob wasn't in it anymore. I didn't think much of it, 
and took the opportunity to get familiar with the other guy. He told me that his name was Lance, and that he had once helped Jacob by giving him a few extra dollars to buy his lunch, and he didn't think Jacob would remember him. We both talked about the rumors about Jacob, and whether he actually had bad parents, or if he was just going through a phase. At some points, we heard loud thuds downstairs, to which we would shut up and widen our eyes at each other. The thudding would stop, and after a few moments, we would continue chatting. I told him about the shouting, but how it could have just been the television. Lance shook his head, and said that he once saw Jacob with his parents in the grocery store, and they had been arguing then, too. At this point, I was glad that I came, because I started to pity Jacob. And that's when he entered the room. I'm sorry I'm late, he said, sounding out of breath. I was trying to get the Wi-Fi password, but it's down right now, the Wi-Fi. Sorry. I told him it was okay, took my iPod from him, and told him that there was always something else we could do. We all waited for the two other boys that Jacob invited to come. It started to become apparent that they wouldn't, and I made up excuses for both of them after I saw the crestfallen look on Jacob's face. We awkwardly chatted for a bit, ate some chips, and talked about our schedules and stuff for 10th grade. He told us he would be moving away before September, and Lance and I asked normal questions to keep the conversation going. Then, after the small talk got tiring, we agreed to fall asleep early. We all brushed our teeth and changed, and then Jacob went to his bed while Lance and I slept on the floor in our sleeping bags. After trying to sleep for what I would say was about 15 minutes, I grabbed my iPod, turned the brightness down, and started to scroll through it. After I got bored with the games and such, I went to my messages and decided to read back on some conversations with my friends. That's when I noticed that on the top, where newly messaged people were, was an unknown number. Confused, I pressed on it and was horrified to see that a bunch of pictures that I had took of my friends and myself were sent to this number from my camera roll. And all of them read, delivered, which meant I was connected to a source of internet for these to be sent. I could only think of Jacob as the culprit, and I got really freaked out, because he had just sent my pictures to somebody, and I didn't remember Jacob ever having a phone. I didn't know what to do, so I shook Lance awake, keeping my eyes on Jacob, who was still asleep. It took Lance forever to wake up, but I managed to make him turn around and look at me through bleary eyes. In a whisper, I asked, Can you come to the bathroom with me? Lance groaned and turned back around, muttering, Dude, no. I shook him violently and told him that he needed to come with me, and I annoyed him so much that he pushed himself out of his sleeping bag and hit me hard on the arm. I was so panicked, I didn't care, and I dragged him out of the room. I shoved him in the bathroom and locked the door, and he looked seriously freaked out. What the hell are you doing? He asked angrily, and I showed him my messages and explained the situation. He told me that he must have sent it by mistake or something, but I told him that this was an iPod, and I couldn't send anything without Wi-Fi. Lance's angry look had shifted to look nervously excited now, and he assured me I was overreacting. But we can call the number on my phone if you want, he said, and I thought that was a good idea. So Lance turned on his cellular data and dialed the number displaying on my messages. The ringing started a bit late, and then we heard the music of an incoming call coming in from one of the other rooms. It took a second for us to realize this, and when we did, we both went into a flurry of shocked nervousness. Lance muted the ringing on his phone and tiptoed out of the bathroom. We heard the ringing coming from one of the bedrooms as we tiptoed down the corridor, and we both shared a terrified look. When we went back into Jacob's room, he was sitting up in his bed and scratching his head. 
Lance quickly ended the call and nudged me like I should have confronted him or something. Jacob asked us what we were doing, and Lance just looked at me, expecting me to answer. I told Jacob I had to go to the bathroom, and Lance was already awake, so I took him along. Jacob just kind of sat there, so Lance and I curled back into our sleeping bags. Neither Lance nor I actually slept. We just turned our backs on each other and lay there, breathing heavily, unsure what to do about this situation. Oddly, I drifted off to sleep and was awoken by Lance early in the morning. He let me call my mom and I asked her to pick me and Lance up since Lance didn't have a ride that early in the morning. We told Jacob goodbye, thanks for inviting us over, and all of that. I really wanted to say something about the messages to him, but I was really, really creeped out, and didn't want to make the whole thing awkward. He did move late August, and I never told my parents about this, only my friends. This happened three years ago. I now have this weird paranoia of handing people my phone, locked or unlocked. This happened in 1985 when I was 17 years old. I was the youngest of my graduating class, and all summer I had been looking at colleges across the region. This is long enough ago that there wasn't any internet, and if you wanted to go to college out of state, and if you didn't have tons of money or connections, you would actually have to take a trip. I was born in Seattle, but at this time my family had been living in Mount Shasta, which is a small town in Northern California. I was unable to attend college on time with the rest of my friends because I ended up having to stay home and take care of my mother. She ended up being diagnosed with cancer at the end of summer and my dad had to continue working 10 hour days in order to pay the bills. So I took care of my mom for a year while my dad worked. Luckily my mom didn't have to suffer for long the cancer had progressed so far by the time they caught it that she passed away in the fall. After my mom passed, my dad made sure I started college as soon as possible. I knew I wanted to go to school in Seattle because the big city life was calling to me. Dad basically handed me $500 and the keys to his old 1982 Chevrolet pickup and told me to go and that when I got there, he would send me money to get an apartment so I could make my way in the city before school started. He didn't want any obstacles in my way when it came to school. He felt guilty for having kept me home while my mom was dying. Not that I would have chosen to be anywhere else, but he was still feeling guilty. So in the middle of fall, I ended up driving my dad's truck north to Seattle. The trip is basically a straight shot from Mount Shasta to Seattle on Interstate 5. It should have been easy, but about halfway through Oregon, the pickup truck broke down. A coolant hose sprung a leak, and I was unable to repair it on the side of the road, so I ended up walking on the side of the interstate northward in the direction of the next town. I had just passed a small town named Green a while back, and the map said I was just south of a medium-sized town named Roseburg. I couldn't be sure how far away from Roseburg I was, but walking wasn't a problem for me, and Roseburg would be much more likely to have a repair shop, so even if it might be further away, it was totally worth the attempt. It was cold that evening, and the wind chill was cutting through my coat and causing me to hate life. I decided it would be best to hitch a ride to Roseburg, since it was getting dark quickly. I thought I looked pretty hot back then, but even still, no one stopped to give me a lift. I kept walking north and putting my thumb out every time a car came up behind me. It was hours later when one finally stopped. It was a big red 18-wheeler that had no trailer attached. It pulled up in front of me and off to the side of the road and honked its horn. I ran up to the truck, thankful that I could finally get out of the wind. As I opened the passenger side door of the truck, I saw a very friendly looking man at the wheel. He smiled and said, Come on up inside. 
As I climbed into the passenger seat, he told me his name was Rick, and I introduced myself in turn. He asked me where I was headed, and I told him I needed to get to Roseburg to get a tow truck to pick up my vehicle I left a few miles back. He told me he had been to Roseburg many times on his routes, and that there wasn't a repair shop or tow truck company open this late at night. He told me he would let me out at a motel so I could sleep the night, and then get the tow truck and pick my vehicle up the next morning. I thanked him for his considerate nature. He really did seem kind and thoughtful. We weren't far from Roseburg, according to him, which made sense because we could just now begin seeing signs of civilization amongst the trees on the side of the interstate. We made small talk while he drove the rest of the way. We discussed the cold weather, current events, and even sports. Somewhere in the conversation, he told me that I was very pretty. It caught me off guard, but he didn't say it in a creepy manner. So I merely thanked him and continued talking about sports. He didn't say anything after that. Kind of just let me talk. You know that feeling that you get when you realize you've been chatting on and on about something and the other person hasn't said a word for a few minutes? Well, I got that feeling because he hadn't said a word since he told me I was pretty. I stopped and apologized for being so chatty and talking his ear off. He looked at me and smiled and said that it was all right and that he likes to hear my pretty voice. That time, he did say it in a creepy way. But sometimes that happens. I doubted that he meant to do that. I kept quiet in hopes that he would start talking, and we would discuss something else. Instead, we didn't say a word. We watched the road, and I just sat there. In a minute, I began looking around the cab, and I ended up looking in the back of the cab behind me. What I saw puzzled me. In the back there was a large brown blanket, some clothes, I'm sure were dirty, and some shoes. The thing that puzzled me was that there was no way that the clothes were all his. Two pairs of the shoes were obviously a little girl's, and some of the clothes also obviously were for a little girl. Something you would expect a ten-year-old to wear. He knew I had seen it and laughed. He told me his daughter had left those in the cab after she had accompanied him on a route last week. He told me he didn't get enough time to spend with her, so we took her on a route a week ago to spend some quality time together. I said that was nice of him and asked him how old she was. He paused for a second and then told me she was thirteen. That made me suspicious because not only did he hesitate before answering, but I've worked in a shoe store before, and I know that those shoes must belong to a much younger girl, both because of the size and the style. It also didn't seem like the kind of clothes or shoes that you would have a little girl bring on a trip like this. It was weird, but not scary. Also, having worked at a shoe store before, I was almost positive those shoes were two different sizes. I told him the shoes were cute and leaned back and grabbed one of them and proved to myself that they had to be different sizes. And no way does a little girl wear two totally different sizes. Still, I wasn't really scared. I just thought he wasn't being totally honest. And that's his business, so I didn't really mind. It was just a weird thing to be dishonest about even to a stranger. I put the shoe back, and when I turned around, I saw the look on his face. He seemed half worried and half angry. I immediately apologized for touching his things, and he said that it was okay, although it didn't look that way. By then we were just entering Roseburg. We kept driving through the town, and he told me he knew a good motel on the far end of town and that he would let me out there. He asked me what I had brought with me in my backpack. It seemed like an innocent question, but it came off like he was interested in what I had on me. Not simply whether or not I had brought any clothes or a toothbrush. I told him I had enough, but I didn't tell him anything specific about the contents of my backpack. 
I didn't have a weapon of any type, just some socks, makeup, and my purse. We ended up passing a repair shop on the side of the road, and he pointed to it and told me that that's the place I should go to tomorrow morning to get a tow truck. It felt kind of strange to me, because he didn't tell me that it was coming up, he just pointed it out. I said I had missed it, and asked what the name of the shop was. He responded by just telling me it was straight south off the interstate, and I can't miss it, as if he didn't remember the name. At this point I began to get a little worried. I didn't feel threatened by Rick, but he didn't seem to be legit. As we kept driving, I noticed that we were now coming to the far north end of Roseburg, and that soon we would be leaving the town behind. I asked him where this motel is, and he told me that it was just north of the town. I told him that was a little far from the repair shop for me, and asked if there was any place closer for me to stay. He didn't answer, and now I'm worried about Rick's intentions for me. I got my backpack and put it in my lap. He looked over and saw it and asked if I was okay. I looked over and smiled at him and told him yes, I was okay, just cold. You know those signs on the highway that tell you how far off the next rest stop, gas station, or motel is? Well, they had those back then too but usually only on the outskirts of a town. It's the town's way of motivating you to stop for gas or lodging now where they can tax it, rather than continuing on and sleeping somewhere unincorporated. Well, we came up on one of those signs. It said there wouldn't be a motel for 20 miles, and we were leaving Roseburg. I knew then that Rick wasn't taking me to a motel just past the town's limit. I didn't know what he wanted, but I didn't want it to happen. I looked over slowly at Rick, and luckily he hadn't seen the sign, I think, because he was busy lighting a cigarette. I began looking frantically out the window to see if there were any places that I could make an excuse to stop at. Maybe I could ask to stop at a gas station for something to drink, and then run away, but there wasn't one anywhere. I decided that I would have to pull out the big guns and ask him to pull over so I could pee. I looked over at him and asked if he would pull over to let me pee on the side of the road. He pulled his lit cigarette out of his mouth and looked at me. He asked, You gotta pee? And I nodded my head, yes. Well, go ahead and pee then, Jenny, he told me. I like the smell, and he smiled at me, and it sent shivers down my spine. I pretended to laugh, and he frowned at me. Don't laugh at me, Jenny, he said. I immediately stopped pretending to be fine, and so did Rick. He could tell I was scared now, and he just gave me this look like he wanted to hit me. I asked him where we were going and he told me not to worry about that. At this point, I could actually see the end of Roseburg coming up ahead. No more lights after that. Just woods. Immediately I heard my dad's voice in my head telling me to run. Not to worry about getting hurt. Just run. I opened the door and tried to jump out. The truck must have been moving at 30 or 40 miles per hour. And as I moved towards the open door, Rick grabbed my backpack. He had been trying to grab me, but I was pressed against the far end of the cab. I heard my dad's voice again, telling me to run, and I tried to pull my backpack away from Rick, but his grip was too strong. I gave up and just fell back out of the cab and into the grass. The impact knocked the wind out of me, and I rolled around in the grass until I came to a stop. I immediately sat up despite the sharp pain in my back and saw Rick's truck speeding up on his way out of town. He didn't stop. I got up and limped my way back into town and ran up to the first home I saw and pounded on the front door. An old man opened the door, looking very tired, yet also very worried. I begged him to call the cops, and when he saw the bruises on my face and the grass stains on my clothes, he threw open the door and let me come in. 
He sat me on the couch while he ran to the phone. His wife came down to find me on the couch crying and him on the phone, telling the local sheriff to come as soon as possible. She got me a glass of water and a blanket. They were both so nice to me. The sheriff arrived and expected me to be drunk at first. About halfway through my story, he realized I wasn't drunk and that there was truth to the story I was telling. He called up two deputies who were asleep at home and had them patrol north on the interstate looking for a big red 18-wheeler. He even called up the next town north and asked them to send a patrol south. They didn't find any red 18-wheelers on the road, but they assumed that he probably sped his way right through their town too before they were able to send out a patrol. The nice old couple who had let me in ended up letting me stay with them that night. The sheriff kept a deputy outside the house all night. The next day he took me to the station to fill out an official report and look at some photos of 18-wheelers so I could pick out the exact color and model. He drove me back to the repair shop, which just happened to be the same one Rick pointed out to me. He had them tow my truck in and had the sheriff's department pay for it. They got my dad's pickup running in no time at all, and the sheriff asked me to stay in town for a few more nights. I was totally fine with that, because I didn't want to meet Rick on the road again. I stayed at the old couple's home for three more nights, and spent my days with the sheriff as we patrolled the interstate and called nearby towns, asking if any truckers had been pulled over, matching my description. I did stay in contact with the sheriff and the old couple who helped me. The old couple both passed away about a year and a half later. I went to their funerals and spoke to their kids, who were about my dad's age at the time, and told them everything their parents had done for me. They were very proud of their parents. I even stayed at their home on my way back down from Seattle when I eventually brought my dad's truck back to him. The sheriff would call me from time to time and ask if he could send me some photos. It seemed every few months he would arrest a trucker who had a red semi or similar vehicle and he would want to see if I recognized him. He says that Rick probably didn't frequent that route as much as he said he did because he didn't seem too familiar with the town, which was one reason I was suspicious of him. Odds are, Rick was a serial killer or at least a child abductor and sexual predator. But he travels the United States, and there is no way to know where he is now. At the time, I suspected he was around 40, which means he would be in his 70s now, and probably no longer on the road. The sheriff told me many years later that there are tons of old folks in retirement homes who have had no families and no one ever visits them. And Rick is probably living that kind of life now, if he is still alive. Wherever Rick is now, I hope he never really hurt anyone. Or at least, I hope he never hurt anyone ever again. But if he did, especially if he did hurt two little girls, whose shoes I found in that truck, then I hope that wherever he is, he is suffering and alone, and all of these years later, we never did find Rick. <laughs>